It's a new year, and we should have a fresh perspective. Satan may have a plot, but God has a plan. And believe it or not, the plot may be part of the plan. Come on, somebody. Because the word says that all things, not some, but all things work for the good of those who love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. Are you called to his purpose? Amen. In the chat, are you called to his purpose? Satan has a plot, but God has a plan. Amen. Hallelujah. As I've been listening to Pastor Ray over the two weeks, one of the scriptures that had stuck out to me is the one about the wheat and the tear. So we know the scripture, Matthew 13, 24 through 30, if you'll go there with me. This is our primary scripture for today. Bless you, amen. The, <laughs> glory to God. He sneezed, if y'all didn't know. Sorry, I grow. You do things like that, and then y'all be like, what did she say bless you for? He sneezed, amen. Come on, somebody. But you don't have to sneeze to get blessed, Robert. How about sick? Okay. <laughs> Glory to God. The parable of the weeds, amen. Jesus told them in 24, Jesus told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while everyone was sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat. Underline, everyone was sleeping. <laughs> Whew. And went away. When the wheat sprouted and formed heads, then the weeds also appeared. The owner's servant said, sir, didn't you sow good seed in your field? Where then did the seed, the weeds come from? An enemy did this, he replied. The servants asked him, do you want us to go and pull them up? No, he answered, because while you are pulling the weeds, you may root up the wheat with them. Let both grow together into the harvest. At that time, I will tell the harvesters, first collect the weeds and then tie them in bundles to be burned. Then gather the wheat and bring into my barn. Amen. So the farmer gave instructions on how to handle the tear. Amen. And the thing is, is that we need to know how to handle the tear as well. But sometimes we're sleeping on the tear. Come on, somebody. We got to wake up because the tear is growing up right alongside you or right alongside us. And we're sleeping on the tear. We can't sleep on it. Wake up. Stay woke. Amen. Now the act described was then and still as a common form of Eastern malice or revenge. It's inflicted on both loss and trouble to the farmer who was expecting a harvest of wheat and now has to contend with the tares that have been intentionally mixed in to cause an inferior harvest. Keep in mind that the tares closely resembled the wheat while the blades were green. But when the field was white for the harvest, the worthless weeds bore no likeness to the wheat that, barred, that bowed under the weight of its full ripeness. But in the harvest of the world, there will be no likeness between good and evil. There will be those that have joined the church but who have not joined Christ. They look like they are fruitful, and then as time presents itself, their immaturity for the things of God is revealed. Come on, somebody. Type in the chat. They've joined the church but have not joined Christ. Come on, somebody. What good is it to join the church if you're not connected to Christ? Wheat and tares look alike, but while wheat produces seeds after itself, the tear is more or less a flower. It's barren good to look at. Think about that for a minute. The wheat produces seed after itself, replicates, duplicates, meaning wheat produces more wheat. It has seed to reproduce. Unlike the tear or weed, it is barren, fruitless, and produces an inferior crop of little or no quality, bitter and inedible. Come on, somebody. Type in the chat, are you producing wheat or tear? We can look around our homes and in our circles of influence and see what we're producing. Are our words, what are they producing, wheat or tear? If I had to title this message today, it would be the wheat and the tear. I forgot what it was. Hold on. The wheat and the tear, separate but not equal. Come on, somebody. Oh, my God. 
Whoever influences you has influence over your tongue. You will begin to speak like they do, complain like they do, act like they do, murmur like they do. Look at the Israelites, how the spirit of murmuring and complaining caught fire, and they wandered the desert for 40 years and did not inhabit the promise, but their lineage did. Their hearts changed, but God's promise did not. The word says that the promises of God are Yay and amen. Hallelujah. So even though our hearts may change and we may change, God's promises do not. When God says a thing, it's going to come to pass. Amen. It may take 40 years, but it still will come to pass. The ground is our hearts and the good seed, the incorruptible seed is the word of God, which is able to give us life. Many times the devil plays this trick on us. The word of God is sown into our lives and the enemy comes in and plants his unfruitful and corruptible seed, which on the surface may look like a word from God. We receive it into our hearts, but then we realize that this is an imposter seed. This is a fake word. This is a counterfeit word. And what the devil has sown plants an inferior imitation seed. The devil can imitate, but he cannot duplicate. Type that in the chat. The devil, can, the devil can imitate, but he cannot duplicate. There is crab, and then there's imitation crab. I'm a crab connoisseur. I love crab. Don't give me no fake crab. I want the snow crab legs or the blue crabs or whatever this crab. I want crab. I don't want no fake crab. We can't afford the fake. We can't afford the counterfeit in this hour. We have to have the real. I want the real thing. Jesus is the real thing. I want the seed of Jesus within my heart so we cannot afford the imitation, the imposter, the immature tear that grows alongside the wheat. It looks just like it into the time of harvest. That's when you recognize that's the separate, separate but not equal. Come on, somebody. When we were in MSG, there was a talk about Johnson grass. I don't know if anybody is in agriculture or in farming, but Johnson grass grows alongside corn. The dangerous thing about Johnson grass is it looks identical to corn. It looks just like it. Even in its infancy stage, even to its maturity, it looks just like corn. And so the farmer doesn't know what's real and what's not. To the untrained eye, they don't know. The dangerous part about this grass, it has an extensive root system which joints everyone to, it, it has joints everyone to six inches. It's going every way, and it's a root system. It's rooted. Its roots are mired and run in every direction. It intertwines with the good roots of the corn. When it grows with corn, it grows alongside and looks identical. When knee high, it cannot be pulled up without uprooting and destroying the good corn. Johnson grass can be cut off at the ground level, but will immediately send up new shoots from the old and from the underground joints. Hence, you cannot destroy the roots by simply cutting off the plant. You can't destroy people. You can't cut off people. Sometimes you have to do it at the root. You have to dig deep in the root and get rid of some things. It's a root issue. It takes root. It takes hold. And when it takes root, it takes hold. It grows. And it continues to grow. And it will snuff out the nutrients that's meant for the corn. It'll snuff it out and cause the corn to be inferior. What am I saying? That there are some imposters that look just like believers that are sitting in the house that are critiquing the house and looking at what they're doing and what they're not doing. It has to be cut off at the root. 
a root canal. There's a root canal that when the dentist has to go down in the root and pull out from the root, you'll be in pain forever if you don't. The kingdom will be in danger if you don't expose the enemy at the root level. We can no longer deal with the enemy on the surface level. We have to start dealing at the root. Amen? My God. Give God a hand clap of praise. Amen? The imposter, the fakery, sometimes we don't realize it until you meet someone and you realize you've met an imposter. You, people usually meet the imposter on the job interview. They meet you when you're the best at it. Yes, I believe in the corporate culture and I believe in, I believe in being on time and late every day on the current job you're on. <laughs> Giving folk a fit on the job you're on. You're the imposter getting the job, and then once you get it, you start bringing those old habits from the old job to this job. The imposter showed up. Will the real you stand up? Come on, somebody. We begin to hear the imposter when the imposter is speaking against the man and woman of God or speaking against Christ or speaking against those things that are about God. We want to talk about kingdom, and they want to talk about this and you want to talk about kingdom and they want to talk about that like pastor ray said this is not that this ain't time for that these are kingdom matters that are being dealt with and it's time that we deal with kingdom affairs we can see what happened this week and all the chaos and confusion god is not the author of chaos and confusion let me just clear that up if there anybody marching on that it is a lie from the pits of hell. It's a rooted lie that will be exposed and uprooted. Fret not thyself. It will be uprooted and dealt with in the kingdom way. God is going to have the final say. God is going to have the final say. He is the king of kings and the Lord of lords. That has not changed. One thing that did not change on November 3rd was that. It's that God is still on the throne. He still sits high. He is sovereign. The child's play, the foolishness. You can see that it's an immature seed that's been planted. And once it's been planted, it just takes root and begins to grow and grow and grow. But eventually, somebody say eventually, eventually. <clears throat> it stops growing <laughs> because God will make it so. Amen. So an inferior seed from the enemy can take deep root in our hearts and it will lead to intentional sin, hypocrisy, false prophecy and heretic behavior. We can go back to Genesis in the garden where God wanted a harvest of sons and daughters and he created and planted man on the earth. As you said, Pastor Ray, we are a seed. God sowed good seed because he said what he created was good. It was very good. Amen. He placed man in the garden and gave him all he needed and set him to be in fellowship with him. The devil crept in and sowed a tear in the form of a word and thought into the heart of Eve. And little by little, the tear grew. The Bible says she saw the fruit and looked at it and didn't, it didn't look like anything would be bad. In Genesis 3, it's, she just, you know, the, the word came forth. The Lord said, if you eat of this, you will surely die. And the enemy comes and says, contrary, and says, oh, you won't surely die. No, no, the, the, it, the enemy says the exact opposite of what God is saying. So you know that that's not God when he's telling you, oh, no, you ain't, no, girl, you ain't going to die. You just going to, you know, know right from wrong. You can know good and evil. You can eat of anything in the garden, just not this fruit. And let me help y'all. It didn't say it was an apple. I'm just saying. I don't know why that gets perpetuated, but it never says what the fruit was. But everybody's like, you know, the apple, the forbidden fruit. It never mentioned what the fruit was. Back in those days, I don't know, it might have been a date. I don't know or a fig. I don't know. We don't know. Amen. 
I'm back. Glory to God. <laughs> but I'm just saying, you know, we get caught up in, you know, tradition and culture and what people say. But, <laughs> but anyway, we see how eating the forbidden fruit, it affected both of them and the world. Because they both believed the corrupted world from the enemy instead of the truth from God who created the garden. They ate the fruit and the end result was they were stripped of their glory and power and cast out of the garden. The consequences were far greater than the taste of a forbidden fruit. <sighs> the thought and idea of Satan gave Eve looked fair and good and appropriate, but the end result was banishment from the garden. And in Genesis 3 and 15, it says, And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed, and it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. What that means is part of the judgment, enmity is mutual hatred and ill will. Will exists between the woman and the serpent. This will continue between the woman's seed or offspring, mankind in general, and the serpent's seed. The offspring will remain enemies throughout all generations. The serpent's offspring is symbolic of demonic forces and also those people who follow the devil and accomplish his will. God says that Satan will always be the enemy of mankind. It follows that people who side with Satan will be at a perpetual war with God's people and that we are engaged in a very real battle between good and evil. Somebody say separate but not equal. Type that in the chat, separate but not equal. God is never inconsistent. Amen? He always says what he means, and he means what he says. But often we need to compare scripture with scripture, particularly when looking at Jesus' parables, to completely understand what the Lord is telling us. And we'll do this as we look at Jesus' parable of the wheat and tares. In early biblical times, the Hebrews used wheat as a main staple in making their bread. They also roasted the grains and ate them. Amen? Amen. Tares are a serious problem in the wheat field because if the tare seeds get mixed in with the wheat when it's ground, the flour and resulting bread are ruined and become bitter, if not poisonous. The tare can be poisonous. Amen? Now let's look back at the text. The helpers went to the farm and explained the problem. So let me go back to the text. So it says, the servants asked him back in um, verse 28. It says, an enemy did this, he replied. The servants asked him, do you want us to go and pull, up, pull them up? 29, no, he answered, because while you are pulling the weeds, you may root up the weed with them, the wheat with them. Let both grow together into the harvest. Stop right there. So the helpers went to the farm and explained the problem, and the solution was to rip out all the tares. But the farmer knew the roots were intertwined and grown with the wheat. If you pulled out the tares, it will pull out the wheat too, prematurely. He waited until the wheat was ripe, then had the reapers harvest the tares first and bind them in bundles to throw in the fire. Next, he had the wheat harvested and stored in his barn. So, of course, this is simple enough to understand that we're talking about heaven quite clearly in the kingdom of heaven. And Jesus' disciples weren't so sure, so he had to explain this again to them that the one who plants the good seed is Christ. The field is the world, and the good seed represents the children of God's kingdom. Amen? Amen. The tares are the children of Satan who plants them along the wheat. The reapers are the angels who gather the tares, everything wicked in the world, bind and burn them. Finally, the wheat, the righteous children of the kingdom, is harvested and stored in the barn, the kingdom of the Father. Leave the gathering of the tares to the angels. We can't take on separating tares. It's not our job to separate the wheat from the tear. That's God's job. God has appointed angels to do that, as Pastor Ray talked about in Revelation, where the sickle, and they come, and they gather the, the wheat and the tear. They, they separate. It's not for us to do it, because the damage is that sometimes we are looking at folk from the exterior and not realizing that they're not tear. Just because they may have something on that may not look like it is new or they may not look like they are part of the kingdom, 
we can't pass judgment on folk what they look like just because of what they look like. You got to start listening to their heart and what they sound like. What are they saying? Are they a duplicate of the kingdom? Are they speaking the kingdom language? <clears throat> Excuse me. Or are they part of Satan's army? Because either you're in or you out. The word says be hot or cold. That lukewarm thing, that don't work out. That, that in-between phase of, okay, I, I think we should, or I know, no, or whoever's right at the time, oh, I'm with them. I'm with them until they make a mistake and be like, oh, no, I was over here the whole time. No, I was right here. <laughs> we see you. You're sticking out. You're a tear. We, we, you can know them by their fruit. That's what the word says. Now, what does this have to do with our everyday life? This parable is almost always used to show the big pictures of eternity and salvation, but it is increasingly, I'm increasingly convinced that it also has some meaning and significance in our lives every day. So let's take a look at this first. In the field of our daily life, it is not Christ who plants the tares. A farmer would never plant wheat and tares together knowing how hard or difficult it would be during harvest time. Christ does not send evil into your life to test you. Come on, somebody. Evil does not come from God. It comes from the enemy when he, we are spiritually asleep. Wake up. Be alert to the seeds of evil, such as greed, hatred, revenge, jealousy. Something you do from selfish motives may seem to be good until it starts to bear corruptible, rotten fruit then the true motives appear. Have you ever known someone who smiles and on the surface they act like they're your friend, but they just trying to manipulate you in the situation because they want their way? They trying to have it their way? It's like Burger King for them. I'm going to have it my way. It doesn't matter. You know, your way or the highway, it's my way. People that are like just manipulative and, and operate in manipulation. That's the spirit of Jezebel. The spirit of Jezebel is not just restricted to ear bobs and miniskirts and makeup. Come on, somebody, because we reduce it to that, but it's a spirit of manipulation that attaches itself to leadership to try to destroy it from the inside out. <sighs> Secondly, all the seeds planted by Christ in your life are good, and they will all bear fruit. Prophet Vicki often talked about dispatching angels. So dispatching our angels on assignment, sending our angels to the place to, to get our blessings, sending them out. Some people have sent out the angels for their husbands. Some people have sent out their angels for financial blessings. Some people have sent out angels for their healing. Angels on assignment. The angels are carrying out their assignment. When God tells them to do something and you dispatch them, they go to wherever you dispatch them. But if you're not dispatching them, they're just sitting on the sideline like, I'm waiting. It's, it's over there, and she and I belong to her, but she ain't even asking for it. It's time to ask. It's time to go after the things of God. It's time to get those things that God has promised us. The promises of God are yea and amen. I remember some time ago that I had this vision of this box. It was a huge box, like infinity. I could see it. And it was all these crimson ribbons that were on it. They were beautiful. And I was like, wow, what was that? And God says to me, that's everything your lineage and the people before you didn't get. It's in that box. And I mean, it was long and it was big. But I was like, well, what about the ribbons? Because the ribbons were so crimson and so beautiful. He said, and the blood is protecting it until you get it. <sighs> and I've held on to that because I said there were some things that my ancestors and my parents' parents and my, the people behind us didn't get that is now stored up for the future generations and for my lineage. And we're going to get this in that box, amen. And it's time that you get this in your box too. It's time that the wheat and the tear be separated and you take a stand on the side of right. 
no longer can just be the in or out or a definite. It's now time to take a stand for the things of God, for the kingdom of God. It could cost us our lives, but it's a win-win either way. It's a win-win either way out it goes. Whether I stay here or I know where I'm going. To be real transparent, when I had my surgery, I came to a place that when they told me what the problems could be or what could happen, I told God, if I'm done, if all my, if this, if my time is up, I've made it all out for you, God. I've done it for you. I've lived my life for you. I've done what you've asked me to do. So I came to terms with, if I don't come off this table, if I don't come out this surgery, I got a lineage behind me of God-fearing men and women that I know that are going to continue to carry the gospel. It may not look like it, but I had to resign myself to that. Like you said, Deacon Shakita, it's like you come to a place where it's like, it's just me and you, God. Nobody else can go in here with me. Nobody else can go with me. I got to go by myself. It's me and you, God. It's up to you. And when I woke up, I was praising God. I woke up in the recovery and I was like, Lord, I thank you. I made it. I'm alive. I was, I was like, I'm alive. I'm still here. And the nurse was like, yes, you are. And she said, do you know where you are? And I just started running down. I'm at, I said, I don't know the address, but I'm at the hospital. <laughs> and, I'm, and I just started telling her where I was because I was so glad that I made it. But I had resolved to myself that I didn't. It was still a win-win. But when I woke up, I knew that there was still work to do, that I still have purpose, that there is still work for me to do. And as I think today and reflect that being this age and I look back on where I was, I just thank God that he kept me, that he preserved me. And that I'm here today to say that we cannot put off the kingdom agenda any longer. We must do what the Lord is calling us to do. We have to be vigilant about the things of God. We can't just walk past them and act like it's not happening. We can't just act like things are just going to miraculously, you know, change. We have to be the change. The church has to wake up and be the change that we want in the earth. God is looking for the bride to step up and do what he has called her to do. The bride of Christ is the church. And we have to step up and do what it is that God has called us to do. Every day that we get up and breathe, he breathes the breath of life into us. is an opportunity to affect change for the kingdom. <sighs> Hallelujah. Let me go back. Tears never turn into wheat. Wheat never turns into tares, separate and not equal. There is a distinct difference in the wheat and tare, but it's not noticeable until harvest time. There is a distinct difference between good and evil, period, with a T. Amen? Type that in the chat. There is a distinct difference between good and evil, period, with a T. Amen? Don't try to make evil into something good. When... <laughs> <laughs> Pastor Rick said, come on, that's evil. They, amen. You're trying to make something evil good. Come on, somebody. That's corruptible. Manipulation. When the tears of evil are blowing right in your face, acknowledge them for what they are. They are tears that are agents of Satan who have a goal of robbing you of your joy and sidetracking you in your call. You have to recognize these things for what they are. And we have to deal with them accordingly. Amen? <sighs> Better yet, the angels, oh, I'm sorry, let me go back. Don't try to separate the tares and wheat in your life prematurely through the human will. Let God be God. There's some things that God has to handle. Amen? You allow God to do that thing. Sometimes we're, we're trying to do it. We're trying to, you know, fix it. We're trying to put our hands in it. And God is like, okay, you got it. But when you let go of it, I get it. When you let go of it, I'll fix it. Amen? The tares are harvested first. Why is this important? 
Sometimes it seems like the bad stuff is always getting the attention. True, that's facts. Think of reapers going through a wheat field, cutting all the tares. If you're the wheat, you're like, well, why ain't y'all cutting us first? We the good stuff, we're the wheat. What about me? And as they take out the tares, you get jostled around. When the angels come to you and take away the tares, it may be a jolt. You may get tossed around a bit. You may get bit one way and then another, but your wheat is not being damaged. The angels have lots of experience on gathering the wheat. <laughs> they know exactly what they're doing. The tares are bound together and thrown into the fire to burn. When you tie a bundle of easily bendable salts together, they become stronger as a whole. Sometimes it seems evil forces are united against us and become more powerful than our lives. That's just an illusion. <clears throat> But this is actually a foreshadowing of, that, of the imminent destruction when it seems like everything is going wrong in our lives and evil is running roughshod over us. It just may be that the angels are harvesting first the tares, gathering them together to burn. It may not feel like it at the time, but this is often an early symptom of victory over evil. Come on, somebody. The angels know what they're doing when they're separating the wheat from the tear. They know to do what first. They have orders. They know how to do it. Amen. Angels don't leave your good unprotected, but gather it all and keep it safe as a resource for the future. When you face a challenge and overcome it, that victory is like wheat in the barn. You'll always have it in the future when you need it. Jesus repeatedly preached that the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And since that is true, this parable of the tares and wheat does not just apply to the ultimate victory over the end time. It applies to the here and now of our daily lives. The angels are always ready to harvest your ripening wheat and sort out the tares. So don't be impressed when evil screams so loud in your life. Thank God that the angels are on assignment and actually gathering them up to destroy it. Amen? Amen. In my closing, Matthew 7 19 through 23. So then you will know them by their fruit. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. But he who does the will of my Father, who was in heaven, will enter. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? And in your name cast out demons, and in your name perform many miracles? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you practice of lawlessness. Spiritual maturity is a distinct quality necessary for spiritual battle. A fight that lightweights or babes in Christ cannot effectively participate in. Keep in mind, go, not go there, but Corinthians 3 and 1 Corinthians 3, 1 and 2. Keep that in mind. Read that. Keep in mind the spiritual battle is where both the eternal destiny for souls and the cultural wars of today are ultimately won or lost. This wheat and tear relationship also describes our modern day situation. The righteous and unrighteous live, work, eat, play together. There seems to be no difference. It is hard to tell apart a born again Christian from a sinner. You will never be able to tell the difference from the exterior just like the wheat and the tear. You will know by the what, what lies beneath and what's in the interior. And God is interested in the heart and not how we look. But one thing is for sure. We all look alike. But while on one, in, well, but one will inherit eternal life and the other will not. Separate but not equal. Amen. May God bless you all. Amen.